life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hello and welcome to part two of Can't Fight Nostalgia for Little Women from 1994. I am Lainey. I am Marshall. And I'm Corey. And today we're going to talk about other things. So if you missed part one, make sure you go back and listen to it. We do have a lot of behind the scenes stuff in there that you could hear as well. Why this is a cult fave, etc. Lots of information, but now we got even more coming at you because this is like one of my favorite holiday movies. Absolutely. Yes. So if you um, don't have enough wassail, get yourself some more. Do it. Or like me with a tea. Hmm. Yes. So here we are jumping in to part two. They talk about how Meg is going to Sally Moffat's coming out party. So the process of coming out has many versions around the world. Austria still observes it with no less than 28 formal balls from January to March. The party was used to signify when women were of the marrying age. So in England, ladies were presented to the queen and then spent the season courting in the hopes to make a successful match. If you've seen Bridgerton on Netflix, that is what this is about. The last time this happened in England was in 1958. Also, we can see in several other kinds of movies and even to this modern day, the, this is the origins of another tradition where girls will go traveling out into the world mm -hmm. when they reach a certain age. We actually see that here every single year in Florida because Brazilian teenage girls will come up for their own little thing and mm -hmm. all the teenage boys will come with them because you know that's where all the girls are right. <laughs> so they'll all come to disney they'll come to universal orlando and that's how they'll celebrate their coming almost out. like rum springa yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and even rory gilmore had her own coming out. that's correct yeah she went to europe so in america this would be called a cotillion or a debutante ball, depending on where you lived. The first ball, the Christmas Cotillion, was held in Savannah, Georgia in 1817, which I thought was very interesting. I mean, you can really see in your head, like, big southern dresses at Christmas time in a large, like, plantation. I can see this happening, right? Mm -hmm. So the ball that Meg is going to takes place in Boston, which is about 26 miles away from Concord, Massachusetts. So it is quite a little travel period with the horses and the mm -hmm. carriage, right? So in their eminent wisdom, the studio <laughs> heads questioned the need for this whole ball segment with Meg because, again, like I was saying, Joe was the main character, so they didn't think that they needed to actually invest the money to do this part of the scene, so they had to fight for it. But it's also very important for Laurie. This mm -hmm. is a scene that shows a lot about him. As we're kind of getting ready, Green Eye March is sitting there with Marmy, and they're kind of talking. She says, I don't really know who Mary's governess is. And I'm just thinking, sound of music? Um, the people that are marrying governesses are pretty wealthy, actually. Um. <laughs> Good Rogers and Hammerstein's reference, though, there. <laughs> so there's this whole caddy conversation that happens while the girls are getting ready for the ball. So the marches themselves do not believe in slavery. So they talk about, like, how the marches don't wear silk, so they're probably wearing linen. But they don't wear silk because children are basically the slaves in creating this fabric if it's not that it's you know african americans that are doing it so that's why they don't believe in wearing those types of clothing because of they're who makes them it. yeah definitely and so since they don't believe in slavery we kind of think that that is what their father is fighting against like he believes it but he's also more of a pacifist so he's doing it as a chaplain because he doesn't have to fight mm -hmm. but we also find out that their father had a school and the rumor is that it closed because he doesn't believe in segregation because a, an african-american girl attended the school and then it had to shut down because of the scandal of it all which is interesting that he had a school because this is kind mm -hmm. of what happens to joe so she follows in her father's footsteps so that's kind of an interesting point as well he was a teacher and now he's a chaplain still teaching. 
Mm-hmm. And while it may seem that Bill Gardner is being really nice to Meg in this instance, I think there's a certain amount of like not so niceness in mm-hmm. what is happening. It's almost like a backhanded compliment in a way, like, oh, you're so good to remind us about slavery. Yeah, and she goes, oh, well, the poor are always with us. Yes, because you don't do anything to help them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a Jesus quote, by the way. So Belle decides she's going to make over Meg, and she has their French maid come over. And the French maid says that Meg has no corset and kind of cinches her in with her hands. I don't know if this is true, because if you look, when she does that, you can see the line of the corset on her on the top of her chest. She is wearing a corset. I think what the French maid is really saying is you're not wearing the type of corset that will cause you to cinch yourself in in a way you shouldn't be cinched in. Mm -hmm. And that will, again, make her feel uncomfortable because you can't maneuver. It's like we say in the modern age, if you cinched, the comparison would be to now, like you are just doing it for beauty. You're not doing it for function, yeah. right? So that's basically what she's saying. I have always wondered this, and I could find no reference to this anywhere, but there are children throwing grapes over the banisters. Yeah. The maids are helping one of the children spit grapes at the guests <laughs> over the banisters. I, I can't figure out why. I don't know if this is a tradition. I don't know what's going on. I think they're just being bratty kids. <laughs> right. But as we see the, the, the ball goes on, Lori sees Meg makes these compliments and not really compliments they're kind of he's kind of being a little mean about it what her dress is like uh, what she's drinking she's wearing makeup that kind of a thing and he's kind of being a jerk but at the same time i think he's also trying to protect these girls that he sees as his family and his sisters because he knows that meg is not being her true self and that's why he's even here right now he's supposed to be taking her around the ball and, you know, introducing her to some of the men around there, the the one that he actually wants to be introducing is the real her. Mm-hmm. That's the person that's worth showing off to him. And right now, she's being anything but. Right. And that's why, like, when he gets up, he's mad. Like, you yeah. can see it. He is mad at what she's doing mm-hmm. because she's not being who he wants to show. And you can tell, too, because every time... He comes around her. She tries to cover up her her chest Mm -hmm. where everyone in the room has already seen this, you know? In fact, Mm -hmm. he's already seen it because the same thing happened when they were doing the play up in the attic, right? But she knows in that moment that she's ashamed of what she is at that moment. Yeah, and that's the thing is he's probably seen women like this all his life of just putting on this front of being so proper and you know all that rich culture and he doesn't want the love of this family that he has he doesn't want to see those people be fake and phony and cruel Mm -hmm. and all of those things that he's seen all his life in high society incidentally the blue dress that meg is wearing before she gets made over by the other girls is the blue dress that later amy wears in a scene and it's this dress is one of my favorite dresses in this it is so simple but for some reason when i think about the dresses and little women this dress is what always comes to mind and meg actually said she sewed it herself right yeah. right because they they don't buy ready-made pieces so yeah. they they do all of their own sewing yeah there is a really interesting discussion about women right and how society views women, as well as how women should view themselves in this whole scene. I feel like there's so much more we could get into, but we're not going to, because I think it's pretty apparent what it is, Mm -hmm. right? So then Lori is going off to college. She's going to Harvard. Joe is not happy. She really wants to go to college. She hands him a book called Dombey and Sons, which is also a Dickens book book although she calls it Dombey and Sons it's called Dombey and Son but then she also finds out that John is holding on to Meg's glove and one of my favorite things that Christian Bale does is in this scene where when he tells her about the glove and he's got the book in front of his face and he kind of does this (laughs) with his fingers I love that so much he's like squee (laughs) Right, yeah. But then we find out after 
Joe comes home and reveals that John Brooke has Meg's glove, we find out that their father is wounded. He is at Washington Hospital, but there's no money for Marmy to go. So here again, we see Hannah is tearing fabric strips for bandages again for the war effort. Joe is supposed to go ask Aunt March for money, but she can't bring herself to ask. So she cuts all her hair off and sells it for mm -hmm. the price of a ticket. John Brooke then comes and volunteers to accompany Marmy to the train because he no longer has to tutor. He is now working for Lori's grandfather, so mm -hmm. he And has, he has, has friends business. where she's going. Exactly. So like I said, Jo sacrifices her hair for the cost of travel, and Amy says, it's her one beauty. This is <laughs> so savage. <laughs> if, I, if I was in Joe's position, I'd be like, <laughs> right? But I think Somebody. she's used to it. I think she's used to it with Amy. Yeah. But I will say that she is very ahead of her time because that hairstyle, the bob, really becomes quite stylish around the turn of the century. So mm -hmm. I feel like in about 50 years or even 40 years, she, she's there, right? Yeah. But she does mourn the loss of it. If you have ever had long hair and you get it all cut off, it is quite a shock, isn't it, Marshall? Yes. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are quite used to seeing my profile picture, I used to have hair that went down my mid-back, mm -hmm. uh, completely uncut for years on end. And then finally I had to go work at Universal and I lost all of that. It was like, so that's the back of my neck feels like. Right. <laughs> but then at the end of this scene, Marmy hugs all of her girls and title drops. I love all my little women. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it comes from, yo. But she does have one thing to say to Beth before she leaves, and that is, please go check on this German family, the Hummels, that we have been giving things to for a couple months now. But it is fall, and th it sounds like marmy has been gone for a little bit. And the girls are trying to make ends meet without Marmy. They're, they're trying to, like, cook. They're trying to keep the house. They're trying to get supplies, but they have no income mm -hmm. still. So, you know, they're trying. And Joe yells out, I hate money. Yep, that sounds like an artist to me. Yep. So Amy gives Joe and Meg some hot potatoes as pocket warmers, which I think is a really interesting note there. But then Beth... She's been going to the Hummels. Obviously, she's got a good giving heart. She's very sweet. So she sees it her mission to go. But they are sick a lot, right? So she's going to the house, and she has this super cute blue gingham tote, which I'm, like, all about. I think it's adorable. I wish I could say that my little giddiness lasted for a while because she goes to the house, doesn't really understand what the mom is saying because she's speaking in German, but she understands that there is something happening and there's a screaming child. The baby was really crying and the baby caused Claire Danes to cry. Uh -huh. Jillian Armstrong held this gene. A lot of people couldn't believe that she was holding the scene on this baby crying, but because she knew she got a real reaction from Claire. Uh -huh. And apparently Claire Danes' mom was like all for it, the, like the reaction they got. But yeah. It Man, was you can see it. Her chin starts quivering and her eyes mm -hmm. are just like, you see the tears coming. Like, I can think that she's very good at putting herself in that situation. I mean, bravo for not faking it because it's see, good. She's kind of confused. There's a confusion to her, which plays well to the whole what's going on with this family that's sick but it uh, it's that confusion is why are you keeping the camera on me why haven't you said cut yet why haven't you mm -hmm. yeah yeah because they just take the baby and just throw it in her arms right. and we're like wait what it's to save this baby right and you they're like please take the baby and, and make it better because you can see the mom is kind of holding her hand over the baby's forehead like fever baby mm -hmm. has a fever right but probably has had a fever for a while and we as an audience know that this is this is the bad turning point for beth right we know that what is going to happen if you don't know you need to go watch the movie because we are spoiling it but again, if you don't know, then where have you been? Mm -hmm. um, then we see that Lori has left a pair in the little like house mailbox that, that they have between their houses. Again, more fruit as gifts. And, and Joe now knows that Lori is home for the holidays. Mm -hmm. Yet again, Joe uses this Jehoshaphat, almost like a, a curse word, like her expression of surprise and 
she's used it so often throughout the movie that I was like, okay, I have to look it up. So Jehoshaphat was one of the kings of Israel. He's one of the uh, iconoclast ones, the ones that are getting rid of the idols and the false gods. Mm -hmm. The along with Josiah, who was the first one of them mm -hmm. to be like, let's do a complete reform, get rid of all of these idols throughout. And people started to use his name in this oath of jumping Jehoshaphat mm -hmm. because it sounds similar to Jesus or Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of swear without swearing. It's like saying Jiminy Cricket. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It was first recorded in the 1865 serialized novel, The Headless Horseman, by Thomas Maine Reed. Interesting. And so this is a book that it's entirely possible Joe could have gotten her hands on. Although, at the time, it was a sixpence per chapter, and it was 20 chapters. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But Joe did finally sell a story to the newspaper. She got mm -hmm. $5, so that should definitely help while their mom is gone. But Beth is home she's kind of laying on the piano and she's like i don't feel good so they're looking in this book to try to figure out what beth has because they're not sure because they can't they can't speak german mm -hmm. so they, they just know the baby's sick they don't know what she has so they're looking and in the book it says they say something about how she has belladonna which i thought was a plant and not a sickness so what we see in there they say that like she's having all the things as if she had uh, poisoning from arsenicum album, which is used as an antidiuretic. Oh, she's gotcha. not taking in water, but they're like, she looks like she's been poisoned with belladonna. Oh, they gotcha. can't tell, like, is she did she eat something wrong? Right. Or is this actually a sickness? Crazy thing about the commentary is she's actually reading a medical book talking all about the symptoms of scarlet fever. It's the first time I ever had that happen in a movie commentary. Oh, wow. <laughs> she literally just went into the great detail about what the symptoms were. But then Hannah shows up and tells him it's scarlet fever, which I kind of assume at this point that Hannah knows German. She kind of looks like she would know German. You know yeah. what I mean? Like she might be, you know, Pennsylvania German, like around that area type thing. Not that she's from Pennsylvania, but you understand what I'm saying. So she says it's scarlet fever and that two of the children died from it. But Joe and Meg are okay because they already had it when they were children, but Amy has not had it. So they don't want to expose her, even though she's kind of been exposed a little already. They have to send her away to quarantine her out. So Lori takes her to be with Aunt March. So at this point, you look at Kirsten Dunst and Christian Bale, and you go, my, my, this age gap is pretty big. And it is for them in real life. But in the book, there's only a three year age difference between Amy and Lori. So their whole thing that happens to them, this relationship is not really that far fetched. I mean, Corey and I are six years apart and you know, it, it's not a very big age gap, but it feels like it because of the actors used in this scene, especially, right? Mm -hmm. So the scene in the carriage with Lori and Amy, it was put together kind of last minute. And that was because there was an illness on the set, but it wasn't Beth and it wasn't Claire Danes. It was Winona Ryder was actually feeling ill and they had a scene planned for her, so they had to scramble. So they literally threw this scene together. They worked it out. They obviously wrote it. I don't think the actors created the lines, but they wrote it for them. And so they threw it together, which is pretty amazing because it is actually one of the more heartwarming scenes in the movie. And it seems like it's something that would have been developed over a longer period of time. But they the actors really pulled it out i thought so the doctor says that beth is very weak and they can't do bloodletting so this leads me to believe that beth has really low blood pressure at this point but bloodletting was used for therapeutic reasons to cure many things i think this was the point where scientific medicine hadn't really happened yet it was a lot of trial and error this is what we've seen so this is what we could do the theory posited that there are four key humors in the human body or liquids that imbalances and these humors were responsible for many physical and mental illnesses it was just a very common to the point where i think it's in sense and sensibility you can see that there's a dish that they actually created for bloodletting which has a, like a groove in part of it to place your arm so that when they bloodlet the the blood falls into the dish after yeah, like it drains bowl, out of yeah. your arm so it's kind of like a, a specially created dish just for you to lose blood and i'm like mind blown there's a great old snl sketch where there was a medieval barber 
who barbers actually did mm-hmm. all kinds of medical stuff. And so he was just said bleed him to pretty much everybody that came in, including Bill Murray that comes in without legs that have just been trampled by a cart. He's all bleed him. <laughs> <laughs> but there actually was a medical journal of the time uh, that was done by a, a doctor named Andrew DeWar. He advised bloodletting for scarlet fever, but he said that it wasn't infallible. He actually cited a case on January 20th, 1835, where they saw this five-year-old boy who had scarlet fever. So they bled him to faintness. And then by the evening, he was running around the room and he was completely back to normal. They did give him some castor oil, but that was it. But castor oil is an antibacterial. Mm. So was it really the bleeding or was it the castor oil that helped? So then they have sent for Marmy. I believe that Lori did send for her and she shows up. She comes in and knows exactly what to do. I mean, she almost knows more than the doctor knows at this point, probably because this is her daughter Mm -hmm. and she's been through scarlet fever twice already. So she probably has seen, and a lot of like the housewives, they know, they know these, you know, homeopathic remedies that they can do for their kids. So she asked for vinegar water, which is known to kill bacterial infections, but it was also used in a variety of household cleaning solutions. Like you had vinegar, you could clean everything. But she's also rubbing her feet, which is which are probably cold. But she's saying we need to bring the fever down from her head. So it's like she's trying to get that circulation in mm-hmm. through the feet to get it to go. Marmy's knowledge and her comforting presence do the trick and help Beth gain strength. But she will have a weak heart from here on out. The crew was like almost forgot that they were watching an actress. The way that Susan Sarandon did that scene. Mm-hmm. They said, wow, oh, okay. They almost acted as if it was an actual medical emergency that somebody was coming in that knew what she was doing. It was that level of like. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we see in this, you know, like right before we find out that Beth is okay, Joe comes into the room and we get this reveal of an empty bed. And then they pan over to the living Beth. And I'm just like, this is so cruel. I'm going to write the, the director a letter. Especially because Hannah's outside sobbing. Yes. Because you're like, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> the most important thing about this is not that he is angry about it. It's the fact that he actually cares enough about this movie now. <laughs> this We have just proven we have indoctrinated him. He's in our cult, Lainey. Yeah. Congratulations. You have admitted to being cultists. It is Christmas again. Yay. And we see the family is decorating, but there are a few additions to their little family now. We see Lori's grandfather is there. And also Lori has brought some friends from Harvard, Freddie Vaughn and Avril Watson. And Freddie Vaughn's going to show up a little later also, Mm -hmm. which is fun. And they're all trying to, you know, get things ready to make everything look pretty. And Amy has this bundle of bows and she's coming down. So she's like, oh, well, well, what do I do with all these bows? What do I do? She hides them right underneath Aunt March's skirts. And Aunt March doesn't even miss a beat. She's like, yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I totally missed that. That's amazing. have to go back and watch that, yeah. Uh, So they basically give Beth a piano. Number one, this piano was we find out from grandfather's little girl which guess what Lori's mother Mm -hmm. was italian pianist therefore this piano belongs to Lori's mother Mm -hmm. and i never got that either i was like oh that's nice it belongs no there's that so number two claire danes in this scene was not supposed to cry it was not written in the script at all But they had actually rehearsed this whole scene without her, and then they brought her in to do it. And when they do the reveal of the piano and the Christmas decorations and everything, she just breaks down crying. And I had read this, and I think, Corey, you Mm -hmm. said they talk about this in the the commentary, where people were crying so hard that they were, like, holding each other and just sobbing because of her reaction to everything. So, basic to explain a little further, that wasn't the reaction that they wanted for that scene. So they literally had to do another take... Where, because the, the rest of the people in the room are just like, Claire did such an amazing job. We're, we're now destroyed emotionally by it. So they had to do a whole another take with it, where they just mm. seemed happy and proud. And look at what we did for Beth. So they start singing Christmas carols. They start with Deck the Hall. And as Marshall and I have learned, because we are in a choir and many of the songs we are singing mm-hmm. has the phrase deck the hall, you deck one hall. Yes. Although you can deck many halls 
In the song, it is one hall. Deck yes. the hall. Deck the hall. But people do not sing it that way. Well, that's because also a lot of earlier, especially Yule traditions where this comes from, they had one big great hall for the entire... The entryway, basically. Well, no, for the entire village. No, a hall would be the actual Oh, like gathering. the building, the hall. Yes. Oh, got it, got it. And that's where they would all gather together. Mm-hmm. Because right. Christmas, a lot of our Christmas traditions comes from the Norse Yule. Mm. So, in singing Deck the Hall, we also see that Aunt March is super into it. Yeah. She's, she's like, yeah, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Meg puts a spring of holly on a cake that she's decorating, which, while very beautiful, is not great. Because holly, as we know, as well as mistletoe, is poisonous. Mm -hmm. So putting it on something you're about to eat, I think, is not the best idea. No. But then there is a really wonderful Christmas present, Their Father Returns. And it always strikes me how open he is to having a house full of progressive women, like, throughout this entire movie. Like, he is totally like, oh, you know, my girls, they're just, they're cool, they're independent, and I'm not stifling them, you know? Meg does accept John's marriage proposal. Joe is not happy about it, because she feels like everything's changing. But one thing that I noticed this time around was that Father March states that our culture isn't taught and it should be required. This is also interesting as we don't know where our food comes from anymore. Not really. I mean, we know what a chicken is. We know what a cow is. But in order to be sustainable, you need to know how to grow food. I think, Marshall, we talked about this a little bit, but there was a law recently passed. Yes, in in, Maine. In Maine. So now in Maine, they have considered food to be a basic human right. And so everyone has the right to grow food in their homes and in their yards, which isn't necessarily true in the rest of the United States. If you were to start farming in your yards, then the agricultural commissions and all that, they'd start coming after you Mm. because they can't go, "Mm, this is... This is part of what we're doing. But it's not just that they can grow it in their yards. It's that they can grow and sell it. Yes. And that is very significant because that means that people can have their gardens. They can be as organic as they want it to be. And there's no real like limitations. And they can sell that roadside stands from their mm-hmm. front, whatever. And it is a way for people to also earn money. So this is kind of a groundbreaking thing, in my opinion, where it feels like we're going back in time. But we are also progressing. Mm-hmm. And speaking of progressing, let's jump four years Woo. in the future. If a year has passed in the first part of the movie, from Christmas to Christmas, the age of the girls now are Meg, 21, Joe, 20, Beth, 18, and Amy is 17. Now, this is kind of reaching almost spinster age, in, in a way. That whole thought of how old you are and not being married off is still kind of growing it's becoming more common to be a little bit older and not be married but we're still kind of encroaching on that but i don't think that the march family believes that way because they are progressive and as another historical note personal for me my grandmother was born in 1901 and married her first husband at 14. Mm mm-hmm So Meg is just getting married. There was four years between her proposal and getting married, which is kind of a long engagement, but we do know why. It's because you can see him when they're getting married. He's wearing a military uniform. And they talk about it at that Christmas where she gets engaged, that John has to serve in the military first and has to put together enough money to buy a house for them to live in. But he never does get that house. I thought he did. But he doesn't. They end up living with their parents. At Orchard House. At Orchard House. Yeah. But he does serve in the military. At this point, we see that Samantha Mathis has now replaced Kirsten Dunst. And again, I have said this. I'm not really a fan of this. She doesn't have Amy's spunky spirit that I feel like Amy would still have, even though it's four years in the future. No, she thinks she has to be really staid and solemn. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. So neither Joe nor Aunt March are very happy with this union for a different reason. Joe just doesn't want her sisters to get married because she wants everything to stay the same. And Aunt March is not happy that Meg is not marrying a rich man. So, yeah. yeah. The painting on the teacups. Amy is with some other girls and they're painting. And I did a little bit of research on this. Apparently there was a tradition of throwing a teacup shower to decorate cups 
for the marriage. And a lot of people have said that when they have come across their ancestor's teacup set, they don't match. And that's because each person would decorate the that's, teacup differently. That's kind of cool. I like that. It's yeah. like color yeah. me mine bridal shower. Right. I, I like that concept it's a It's like the, the, you know, make me mine pottery, but yeah. just with teacups, you know? I liked it too. I thought it was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Lori is now graduated from Harvard. We see that Joe's hair has grown out. So are we back to normal? Maybe, I don't know. But Lori finally puts his flag in the sand and says, Joe, we should get married. Joe's like, I won't, I won't, no, I can't. I can't with you. I'm sorry. I f- you're like a brother to me. I love you, but we just can't. We have the same temperament. We would be fighting all the time, etc., etc." And she says, neither of us can keep our temper. And he says, I can. Unless provoked. That's the meaning of keeping your temper, Brosif. And as much as I hate to say it, she's probably right. But here is where I have to make a differentiation here. So they were so successful at bonding and creating that chemistry together that you cannot help but in this moment be like, no, you guys are so good together. Why? You know, you genuinely want them to end up together and later on, there's nothing really helping you root towards the opposite, which we will talk about. But quite honestly, at this moment, they just their chemistry is so good, mm-hmm. right? And as much as she is right, though, her reasons are not well stated in this manner. She says she will never be a wife. I mean, never say never there, girl. Yeah. And instead, she should say, my feelings towards you are not romantic. It's just brotherly. I feel like you could do better. I mean, she's upset too, you can tell. Yeah. But all in all, I feel like she's just so taken aback by this that she, more things are changing. More things are changing. She can't deal with it, right? She's mm-hmm. overwhelmed. And Lori is about to run off. I have a different reading on a lot of the things that he says because it sounds... Almost like he's proposing to her, not necessarily just because he loves her, but because he wants to let her be whoever she wants to be. Mm. And that she'll fall in love with somebody sometime. And if she does, because of the kind of passionate person she is, it's entirely possible that whoever she falls in love with, she's going to lose herself to this man and stop being the person that she wants to be in the now. This person that he's loving as a family, loving, and instead become what this other person wants her so to be. Similar to what he said to Meg at the ball. Then. So darn insightful, Marshall. So much. that That's why he wants to marry her, so that she can be herself. And that is going to also be a major determining factor about him being okay with whoever she does marry, is if this man makes her herself. Mm, good. But she is still devastated about the fact that she turned him down because she really wants to say yes, but she knows in her heart she can't. So Amy and Beth are talking to her a little bit. Amy is wearing that blue dress that Meg wore to the coming out party. But Joe feels stilted, rejected almost yet again when Aunt Marge decides that Amy is the one going to France with her and not Joe, who was her companion for so many years. But for four years... Amy has been her companion. Basically, ever since Beth got scarlet fever, Mm -hmm. Amy has now been Aunt Marge's companion. So, yeah, Joe feels very, like, rejected and, like, just hurt and overwhelmed all over again. So, Marmy decides to send Joe to New York, which is a different world altogether. So, she lives with a single mom. I'm sure that there are a lot of single moms about this time because the war is making a lot of widows right now. And this single mom runs a boarding house to make ends meet it is implied that her husband died in the war and And in fact she even says hey you know her her father knew your father Mm -hmm. so yeah they they confirmed he died in the war he knew father march and that's how marmy knew to send her there right so joe is teaching the two little girls their names are minnie and kitty Mm -hmm. in the book the age difference between friedrich bear who we see living at the boarding house, and Joe is 15 to 20 years, meaning he should be about 35 to 40 at this point. So while the age of the casting is appropriate, I am not drawn to him as a solid connection to Joe. So I kind of blame, again, like I said, the chemistry that she had with Christian Bale, which was strong, which she does not have with Gabriel Byrne. 
There is some production issues with that. The big culmination at the end, that was their first scene. So you have to have some kind of chemistry. Mm-hmm. So I, that they were kind of thrown together in the worst of circumstances a lot. I'm not saying they, that it was a perfect match, but there were also some production issues that made that. And as we see so much, she has this portfolio, this like folder that she keeps her book in. There's no other way to keep the pages together except in this folio. And she's walking around the street, but she's got it upside down and it's not buttoned. There's like a little button with a piece of fabric that holds the folio closed and the papers inside, but she doesn't have it done up. So she runs into uh, Friedrich Bear and all of her papers go all over the ground. The folio is super cute, by the way, but kind of problematic. So as they're making the paper dry, they start talking and she finally explains her family's religious beliefs. And we're going to dive into this a little bit here because it it is based on Alcott's religious beliefs. So the Joe explains that her family were transcendentalists. The core belief is in the inherent goodness of people and nature. And while society and its institutions have corrupted the purity of the individual, People are at their best when they're truly self-reliant and independent. And it was based on German romanticism, and there was also a very deep value for nature. You know, as we see them being out there in the woods and playing and, and using a lot of the homeopathic remedies, that's what is part of this transcendentalist nature. Emerson, Thoreau, and the Alcotts all practice this. In fact, Bronson Alcott is both the father of transcendentalism and Louisa May Alcott. So... It's very close to home to her. Mm -hmm. However, the movement was dying off by the 1840s and was out of practice, as Bear says. But Joe says it was still practiced in their family. We watched a documentary on Little Women, and I believe that Bear was kind of Emerson. If I remember right, the comparisons, like she had actually patterned these characters after people that she knew. And I Mm -hmm. believe... Bear was Emerson. I can't remember if it was a lorry that was Thoreau. And again, we do see the fruit as gifts theme here as Bear gives Joe and the little girl some oranges. This next scene I like to call a lively debate, right? So it seems to be that a bunch of the people that are in the boarding house are all hanging out in one of the rooms and they're having a talk and some food. There's wine, there's fruitcake, there's chocolate, and there's cigars that I saw on the table. The conversation is sort of progressive, but it's regrettably progressive in my opinion. There is a man who is Donal Logue. If you guys know Donal Logue, he's in The Patriot. Um, and Gotham. Uh-huh. That as well. He is advocating not just for the vote, but also basic rights for women and black people that should be written into the Constitution. Now, one person says that the 15th Amendment has been passed so they can vote, but we see that even now the Civil Rights Act is not fully passed and there are a lot of hurdles to cross in order to even vote today. And this is over a hundred years Yep. at this point. Another lame man down there. <laughs> I just lame I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, he's a lame said, a woman has no need of suffrage if she has a husband. Now, this is stupid because this assumes that either women always agree with their spouse or that they have no brain to think with or that they are even married to a man in the first place or married at all. Yeah. Okay. All of this fallacy. <laughs> Sorry, mm-hmm. dude. You're a lame They also talk about being, how women are a moral force, as in they act better in manner than men, and therefore should be allowed to testify and act as jurors, because morally they are better. This is an interesting point that these men think women act better than they do, but they still don't give them respect as equals. Yeah. Which to me is like, they're okay with the fact that they're immoral. It's why men have been trying to keep women out of actual holding office. Right. Because they thought they were too moral in their boys club, which where they were kind of doing immoral things in Washington. They thought they would clean it up so they didn't want to allow them in. Because morality and power grabs just don't flow. Well, the logic of advocating for women or minorities, but not coming from the same background to understand them, is also one that is common and has the need for people to be respectful of those they are fighting for. And actually, I just saw a TikTok of a guy who was, he's a black guy in politics, who left because... There was a whole bunch of his white colleagues. They're also they're all saying that they're white allies, and as soon as he said something to them that didn't fit the narrative 
that the white allies were trying to say, they all turned on him. Mm-hmm. So he left. And so it's still going on. Yeah. It's kind of a weird, like, twisted situation in, in all respects. But in, even in 1994, this... The person writing this had the wherewithal to put these this conversation that took no more than a few minutes, but is so deep and mm-hmm. so profound. Like, it's one of the reasons why I think th- that this movie is really underrated for what mm-hmm. it is. And this great line might have been Donna Logue that said it. You would have been a great lawyer, Miss mm-hmm. March. And she said, oh, I could have been a great many things. Mm-hmm. Which is a great line for that. So then we see that even in New York, Jo had a newspaper publish two of her stories. She has to publish, though, under a male name to even get looked at. But Friedrich thinks the topics of her stories are not the best thing that Joe can do. And while his intentions are to encourage her to write from the heart, the way he tells her to do it is to put down the work she has already done, which is not really the best way to come at this. Mm -hmm. It also seems like Jo is ashamed of the cap that she wears to get her into the writer's mood because she kind of hides it from Friedrich when he is at the door to talk to her, which is sad because I think it's quite interesting and quirky. But he has come to take her to the opera, which she has never done before. So they go and they actually sit up in like the upper part of the wings where the crew does their work. The opera which Joe and Friedrich watch is George Bizet's Pearl Fishers, which was first performed in Paris in 1863. So it's of the time period. However, the opera was not performed in the U.S. until 1892, long after the action of the film. And for those of you who don't know, this composer, the one that created Pearl Fishers, also created Carmen. Yes. Yes. I did some looking because Friedrich does do a lot of translations of what's going on for her. Mm-hmm. He doesn't quite always get it right. He's like, oh yeah, so the, this character, she's a goddess. Priestess, mm-hmm. go on. And I'm. it, it kind of continues on like that. It's like right. close, but not exact. Right. So we talk about how this was a French opera, but we do go to Paris now because we want to see what's going on with Amy. Amy is now kind of courting Fred Vaughn, who Laurie caused a meet cute with them mm-hmm. back in the day the college, um, yeah. so Lori was kind of uh, in charge of getting that one done now they're together and Lori comes back into the scene to kind of introduce himself he comes up from behind her and then he honks her nose <laughs> this is a reference to her childhood thing of having the clothespin over her nose because she thought it was too big mm-hmm. and we're gonna see he doesn't stop there no it doesn't But we are going to return back to New York, where I find it really interesting that a gardener is planting red poppies outside the boarding house. And Friedrich has stolen a couple to put on Joe's tea tray. Now, this flower shows up a bit in Little Woman, and we're going to track it a couple other times. It's very symbolic. Interesting enough, in the 1920s, the red poppy became a symbol for the American Legion to memorialize soldiers who died in World War I. When Joe puts her manuscript under Friedrich's door after she is done, it is completely loose. There is nothing holding it together. I would be afraid that when Friedrich opens the door, the pages will now be out of order. All right, let's go back to Paris. There's a really interesting transition that happens here. So you see two little girls pulling a carriage. And when I look at it, I say, oh, it's Kitty and Minnie, right? Mm -hmm. We're in New York. But then all of a sudden, along comes Amy and Laurie. So it transitions from New York into Paris in this one swift move. And because this was where I noticed it, I didn't have time to go back and look and see if they did this anywhere else. But I was like, oh, that's kind of a clever transition that it goes from one to the other. Mm -hmm. So while Samantha Mathis is still being formal in her posture, I believe that Amy would have played at being formal rather than just being naturally formal. Like she would be overly formal Mm-hmm. You know, and like, I am putting on airs dramatically, you know? Yeah. I feel that when she says she finds Lori changed, he could kind of say the same thing for her Yeah, <laughs> in this spot. But Lori does make a very good point here. When she says she doesn't wish to be loved for her family, she is really marrying for money. And isn't that just so much worse than yeah. marrying for family and love? Mm-hmm. But what's really weird about how he says this is his speech sounds it sounds like the start of a sociopath 
sounds like somebody who is very not stable and not right in the head, who's just so lonely that he's like, I really just want to be a part of your family. I'm going to become a part of your family. <laughs> but that's not how he means it. It no. really isn't. He's just in a dark place. He you is know? in a dark place. He's depressed. Place. Yeah. He's like, you know, Beth isn't doing well. You're dating this dude. Meg's married. Joe won't have me. What will I do with my life, basically? Yeah. Back in New York, we see that Joe is putting a poppy in her dress buttonhole. Again, Bear says to her that she needs to write with passion, and he's pushing her. I think he's a little more successful at conveying the meaning this time, but it may not be the right time for her to hear this message still. It's kind of funny, too, because Lainey and I are big Anna Green Gables fans, and mm-hmm. they do have the same yes. same thing. Where write, you should write what you know. Stop trying mm-hmm. to write this crazy fantasy Gilbert stuff. totally tells Anne that she should write about what she knows, and she gets mad at him, too, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. But so she's so angry, she takes the poppy, crushes it, and throws it on the ground on the telegram. Mm-hmm. Is this foreshadowing in some way? Yep. But this is now a double blow for Joe. She's got someone mad at her. And her sister is really, really sick. So she goes to Concord and she sees Meg. And Meg says, you know, she she clearly is pregnant. And she says, why didn't you tell me? And Meg, being the old-fashioned way of thinking, doesn't speak of pregnancy, doesn't speak mm. of these things. Why? It's not proper. It's natural. <laughs> it's a natural thing. Yeah. Uh, and this is where we do also see that Meg and John do live at the house with... Beth and Mr. and Mrs. March and Hannah. So Joe is kind of taking care of Beth a little bit. And I have always loved this broth warmer Uh that Joe has. It's kind of like a wax warmer with a plate for broth to warm it up. It's kind of cool, really. Hmm. Like it would be the precursor to like one of those cup coffee cup warmers. Oh, yeah. Type things. Yeah. So cool. And in a throwback, Joe is reading to Beth from Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers. And they've moved Beth piano up to her room. But once Beth does die, Hannah is tearing those red poppies. She's scattering it on the piano, on the bed, and over the dolls. Now, one thing I did learn about previously is that the reason why they did this, the flowers, was to cover the stench of death and decay. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, ring around the rosies, pocket full of posies. That's what that comes from. You want to make it smell better because of the dying people. That's kind of one of the things that's happening here. But also it's the symbolism of the poppies and how it kind of comes full circle. You know, it happened in New York, this poppy theme, and then poppies on the be- deathbed. I also kind of see this almost like a purification Mm -hmm. ritual. She's scattering it not just on the bed but also on the piano which Beth loved. She's also scattering it on all of Beth's dolls. Right. Especially one that there's like one in the middle that's very important and she scatters a lot of it on that It's her favorite doll. It's the one that Beth was carrying through most of the movie. So that's what it almost feels like. And the director had the actress actually do some kind of like originally she patted the doll on the head but that didn't kind of seem right so that she just kind of squeezed the doll's hand. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and just to be on the nose about this this portrayal of this, it was Scarlet Fever and their poppies. And the red, red poppies. poppies so. Mm-hmm. so as we're, this movie is starting to wind down, we come to the part that I call the family comes back together. We learn that Aunt March is sick. So Amy is actually staying at like a hospital while Aunt March is convalescing, but she can't travel back overseas by herself. It's not proper. This might be the first time I realized that their father is actually there when Beth dies. I never remember that. Mm -hmm. He's such a secondary character that when he pops up in the background, you're like, oh, there he is. Yeah. But he's there. A lot of crew members had had a loss around this time. So they couldn't even be in the room for Beth's death scene. It was a very skeleton crew. And because there was such a familial bond with the cast and crew... That was a thing. It was really, really palpable scene. So they go ahead and do the Beth's death scene with her and Joe. And when they get the dailies back, you know, back in the day when we didn't have digital kids, we had film. They had to process it. It came back with some weird, what we call artifacts now, digital things, but weird little dots and stuff on the film. Uh, they had done such a great job, but the actors had put their hearts and souls into this scene and now they were going to have to do it again Mm. so there's something about doing another take but when they had 
felt this much for each other and put so much into this scene and now they had to do it again winona was angry that they had to do it again that it, she didn't i don't know that she didn't blame the director but she wasn't talking to the director on set like it was that level of emotion so they had to reshoot it and to set the mood the director actually played this violin solo from schindler's list to kind of just bring in that somber mood so as we said before amy is at the hospital with aunt march but Lori comes to take her back over to the united states because she can't travel alone i love how fast like he hears that she can't come he's like i'm changing that right because Joe had written him a letter, so he mm-hmm. f- he just figured that out. It's awesome. Winona plays the scenes where she's writing the Little Women book. When she finds Beth's stuff in the trunk, she plays the scenes with so much maturity and wisdom. I mean, she's in her early 20s here, but the depth of what she is conveying and feeling in these scenes is profound to me. Like, just what she feels you can tell what it is mm-hmm. that she's feeling it, there's so much depth but now she's going to write the story of little women so we're hearing parts of the movie replayed in the background as we see a, kind of like a, a camera pans around a circle it's like an audio montage in right that sense where it's the music but also the voices i really feel like alcott this was like her most meta of meta places because she sees herself as Joe in this book. So she's writing Little Women about Joe writing Little Women, okay? Also, she has three sisters, just like the Marches did, and one of her sisters did die. So there's a lot of, like, Alcott's life that is mirrored here. Also interesting to me is that while Huck Finn is required reading in school, this book is not. And it's inherently just as important as its themes. More important, really, actually. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't have to read Huck Finn in school. Oh, I did, yeah. Alcott also wanted to keep Joe single at the end of the book. And really wrote against so much of what was expected for women at the time. But then she was like, fine, I'll just write some kind of romantic thing at the end. After Joe is done writing Little Women, she tucks a red poppy in the twine that keeps the book pages together. So my question is, is this for Beth? Or is it for Friedrich? I feel like she's putting it in for Friedrich, but there's a little bit of a note of it there. This is almost like her note saying, I just wrote from the heart, by the way. Mm-hmm. Because my sister just died, my sister's in here. Mm. Yeah, it's, I think it's a bit of both. We see that Meg's babies are born, and they are fraternal twins. There's a boy and a girl. One of them is named Daisy, and I can't remember the other one. Even though I've read Little Men, and they do go to Joe's school at the end. I can't remember the man, the boy's name right now. But the family is all together, including Grandfather Lawrence. They're all downstairs without Beth, but they're all together because Amy has shown up. There is a very long voyage during that time that Lori gets married to Amy. So mm-hmm. now they're married and they're there. Yay. And Amy does show up with a, a painting. And she's like, yeah, so I paint. I was like trying to paint all these different things. But ultimately, the only thing that I could ever think of was home. So I painted Orchard House from memory. Mm-hmm. And that painting looks a lot better than some of the stuff I've been framing lately. <laughs> I'm still not altogether happy with the chemistry between Amy and Lori. But there was better chemistry with Christian Dunst and Christian Bale, too. But it's the same problem I have with Joe and Friedrich. There's no chemistry there. Since Aunt March left her house to Joe, it's now foreshadowed that she will open a school very similar to what her father did. And it's a story called Joe's Boys. In fact, Little Woman is actually only part one of the same book, Little Men being the second one and also Joe's Boys. So there's like three in the same thing. The way the book is printed is unique too. When she opens the package from the publisher of Little Women, it's long pages. So it's almost like page one is on the top and then page two is on the bottom, the way that it's printed. I've that, never really seen how it like galley, that. That's probably the original galleys, mm-hmm. how they were printed like that. We do also see that Hannah is winding yarn from this like, it looks like an umbrella accordion looking thing. It's called a swift. 
So you use it to hold a hank of yarn. So when you get the yarn from the wool, from the sheep, it will be in a ball and then you will use like the spindle to make it into parts of yarn. And when you do that, you don't wind it into a ball all the way, you wind it into this hank. That's kind of a long circle thing. So you put this long circle thing on the swift and then unwind it to roll it into a ball after that. And that's how we get our ball of yarn. It's really interesting. I watched a modern video about someone who had a Swift and I was like, how do they use this? And it's pretty cool as someone who crochets. I think that saves you a lot of arm work <laughs> to use this. We see that Bear has dropped by the book. Joe runs outside and gets him, gives him an umbrella because it's starting to rain. But guess what? That umbrella has a spring clasp. Uh, oops. Wah, wah, no. You can actually see the metal part of the clasp sticking up out of the pole. The pole looks to be bamboo of some kind. That's fine. But there is this metal part, okay? So while there's a ivory handle, it's very period, okay? The umbrella probably would have been opened manually without that clicking sound. And you can hear the clicking yeah. sound when he opens it. He goes, okay? In 1852, Samuel Fox of the English Steels Company change the design of the umbrella to use the same steel used in women's corsets, which is actually a spiralized steel. It's very strong, mm -hmm. which means a lot of the issues we have today of the umbrella going inside out because the metal sucks would not be happening with these steel springed umbrellas. If you guys don't know how they do sound in movies, a lot of sound has to be replaced after the fact, after shooting, which is called ADR or looping. They have to go into studio, literally stand and watch themselves talk on a screen mm -hmm. and re-enter the dialogue. The director is so proud that during this rain that they had, and it's quite a bit of rain, they recorded it all on location. They did not have to replace any of the dialogue between Bear and Joe. Which means that umbrella click, totally real. <laughs> <laughs> Friedrich says that he is going to be taking a ship west from Boston because the schools in the west don't care about his accent. This trip would probably take him about a month and a half. And I believe he would have to go down the southern part of the country in order to get around to the west, meaning he would probably have to go through the Panama Canal at some point. Mm -hmm. And here we get the cheesy line alert when Frederick says his hands are empty and Joe says they're not empty now and puts her hand in it. I'm sorry. I love this ending, but this makes my eyes roll every single time I hear it. And yeah. the, the, the fact that he even says, but my hands are empty. The entire point of it was just to give her that line. No. <laughs> yeah. it's Who wrote it, that? It, If you're going to get a really bad line, if you want to put yourself through some torture, watch In the Good Old Summertime. It has the worst quote unquote romantic last line of a movie ever we're in a screening room in hollywood at columbia studios and the great and almighty men that have been fighting along the way we needed a holiday to make this movie happen yeah they cried and hugged each other in the screening room at the end of this movie yeah they did and then they admitted that they were wrong about men won't go see this movie and all that stuff yeah they are mm -hmm. so marshall before we wrap everything up you talked about how you didn't really have a lot of interest in seeing this movie again you were just kind of like eh, i like the 2019 one better what are your feelings now that we have dived really deep into this the the two movies focus on very different things mm -hmm. This version of the movie focuses much more on the family aspect, on the togetherness, on the warmth of the characters. I feel like the 2019 focuses a little bit more heavily on the feminism and on women's rights and Joe writing. That's why I feel like they are very different movies. They're both very good. Okay. But how do you feel about this movie in particular now that you've watched it with this different eye? I could probably keep on watching it, but especially now that we're seeing more details in it. Like, it kind of fits along the same lines as rom-coms to me and that, like, watching it over and over again, it has to be for, like, little details. Mm. But it is better than I remember it being. It's not as boring as it was the first few times that I've seen it. Success! Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for staying with us for both episodes of this movie. How important it really is for the time period. And we didn't even think it was going to be this big. At but the current moment, we're going to be doing some cuts. But right now, 
This recording says that we've been recording for two and a half hours. That's correct. So thank you so much for listening to this. We are very excited about next month's offering. It's going to be seasonal as well. So I'm excited for that. Might not be what you think, though. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and holidays. Many holidays. Happy holidays, folks. May they all be merry. So thank you for listening to Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things we talked about in today's podcast. You can find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. You can also find at Elated Geek on our Instagram. And you can also find Elated Geek Tweets on Twitter. If you want to go to a website, we have www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us to continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics that you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at And until next time, geek out.